So I'm Mark McKnight. Um, my class is a graduate course. Um, it's the it's set up to be won't be for every student in the program. It's set up to be the capstone course in the accounting track for the MBA program. So regulation and compliance. Um, because it's MBA students and not accounting students, we've made it much more of a managerial and internal focus. Um, and so we're not, we, we've taken the, uh, the avenue with this track. We're not really training accountants. We're training managers to use accounting information and data. <clears throat> so within this one, the, uh, the, the perspective or the lens that we're studying some of these regulation and compliance issues is studying fraud. And so that's, that's the backdrop that we use for uh, really not only this course, but leading up to. So the other courses that they will have before they get here um, will be a, a, a introductory at the graduate level, uh, managerial accounting, a financial statement analysis course, and an internal audit class. And so again, all of it's more of a managerial perspective than, than say what a CPA would give or something like that. Um, I, I'm not sure in terms of uh, accomplishments. I mean, just getting the course finished feels like an accomplishment. Um, a couple of things that I do that uh, that I found to be useful and, and they're not necessarily uh, typical kinds of things. Um, I always keep an email archive. Every email that I send to students, if you've done this for very long and I've taught online for over 15 years, um, invariably somebody pops up and says, well, I didn't get that email. So every email that I send out, I copy and paste down into this folder and with an original sent date, and I tell them in, in my kind of weekly messages and, and different posts, be sure you're checking the archive because, for example, some of our uh, MBA classes have a lot of students. The one that um, I just opened yesterday that starts prior to this one has 167. So it's certainly possible some of my emails will get uh, folder to junk mail and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so that, that's something I've done to make sure that they have access to my messages and they can look back over time. Everything else, I think, uh, for the most part, is fairly, uh, fairly typical. I put a notation in here about course prerequisites. Um, because of the way the MBA program works and it's kind of cyclical, this is designed to be the capstone course. It doesn't mean that it's the last one that they will have. So we have to approach it from that. Each of these classes start really basic in the first module and they build the board uh, fairly complex uh, course projects and that sort of thing at the end. I do like to separate separate the uh, the syllabus and the policies because what I found years ago, actually I found it from my doctoral advisor, so it's been that far back. His course syllabus was 13 pages long. This wasn't an online class. This was just, and, and I remember asking him about it once, and he said, I can tell you the semester and the person that caused every one of those rules, right? And, and I started thinking about all the policies you have and how you expand that in an online class. And so I like to separate those so that the syllabus is two or three pages, not 15. It just um, increases the likelihood that, uh, that they'll see these things. Um, I put in a detailed course schedule up front, and I also like to put a copy of the uh, discussion board grading rubric in there. So they're both posted. They can get to all this stuff in other ways, but right up front, it's, it's nice for them to, uh, to have access. You talked about a boring class. Accounting regulation and compliance is a mixture of accounting and law, and so um, one of the things that uh, that I'm proud of is that I didn't take the approach of just doing lectures um, for these. There are certainly a few of those in there. Um, I tried to incorporate uh, incorporate all kinds of things. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but I'll give you um, probably my favorite example in the class. So you guys are familiar with the television show Breaking Bad. Um, this is a scene from one of, I don't remember which episode, it's in the first three or four episodes of the first season um, where they're figuring out what they're going to do and how they're going to handle their money. And this is a meeting that, uh, that this gentleman who uh, categorizes himself, Kingston is his name, as a criminal. Um, has with an attorney, and he's kind of trying to convince him to purchase a nail salon. He said, I'm a criminal, yo. Yeah. <laughs> kind of his, his mindset. And so what he does, what, what a lawyer does, is um, explains to him the process of laundering money. And I found this clip, I mean, it's a perfect, here's the three elements of, of money laundering, and it's got subtitles and whole thing, and perfect way to show you what money laundering is without me saying, well, here's the three elements of money. 
So there's not tons of that in there because it, obviously, you know, um, building a class like this, you've got time commitments, and I, I just couldn't sit there for hours and, and find perfect examples from um, television and movies and things like that. But this was one that I was familiar with, and as soon as I got to that part, I said, I'm, I, I have to find that clip. And luckily, I, I found the one that had the subtitles. Um, each one of the modules are fairly standardized. They're not uniform, but they're really close. And I did that, um, uh, let me talk a little bit about the structure. The first two modules are, are background and overview. Again, we're starting with the assumption that this could theoretically be not only your first um, class in the track, but your first class in the program, and theoretically your first accounting class. And so we back up to square one and I do that for two modules. So the first module is what is fraud, how does it work, what are the components? Um, the second one gets into what we call related schemes. So it's not necessarily fraud, but corruption, bribery, some of those kinds of things. From that point forward, modules three, four, five, and six, they build a piece of an organizational compliance program. So they'll write an executive summary. Um, they'll write a, a section on detection policies. And, and at the end, um, which is a shortened week. It's it's all these classes are seven weeks, except for the fact that the last week is only five days. And so in the last week, all they do is take those sections that they wrote along the way, go back, make edits, and finalize. So they come out of course having written a compliance program for an organization. Um, so that's that's kind of the structure. Virtually every unit has a discussion and a quiz. The way I do discussions, has, uh, each one has two sets of due dates. So there'll be, the original post will be due on Friday, and I turn them into mini essays. Right? This first couple are two to 300 words, some of them are three to 500 words. So they're, you know, they're writing a lot without the feeling of setting down and writing a paper. That's, that's the mindset. So those are due on Fridays, then they have the weekend to respond to two classmates and they get some parameters there. Usually that's Part of the essay is maybe a good way to, to put it. These classes tend to be really small. I quoted the, the one up front that is the core class in the MBA. It's got a lot of students. I just taught one of these track classes in the summer. It had 11 students, right? So, so these, are, these are much smaller groups, and these discussions turn into really expansive kinds of uh, interactions because you can't hide, right? There, there's nine of you, so a little bit different story in, in the really large classes. Uh, discussions. The only other thing that I can think that I do, um, and, and I'm sure lots of people do this, is I spend a lot of time developing grading rubrics for the compliance project because it's such a customized project. Just using a standard Wells Worth 50 points didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So I will go to the final module. Each one of these is a little bit different. They can click on the project and then view the rubric, and here are all the components and the point ranges for what they have to, uh, what they have to do. So I did that on a mini scale. Each one of the components is worth um, 25 points. So on a, on a smaller scale, they get feedback along the way, and at the end, it's obviously worth a lot more points um, once, I, once I've had a chance to look at each part of it and provide feedback. Questions? I, I, I don't know. Uh, Mina was a lot of help. She was a constant reminder. She said you'd have this done by Wednesday. Now I know it's Friday. Um, but, but, uh, but, but I've gone through the program, and honestly, you know, I, I taught online a lot. The, I, I say this without malice. The, the slight nagging is a good thing because I would put it off until the course starts. And all right, I got to say two weeks ahead of the students. So, so these constant reminders and, and deadlines are, are a really good part of the program um, because it makes me sit down and, okay, I've got to get this finished. Um, even if I'm meeting with her at 10 and it's 9.40, I'm <laughs> working to get something done. So. Any other questions? you do any uh, plagiarism check on the short essays? Or? They're so customized. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Um, I don't know how in the world they could um, because they're not stock essays. They have to pick a company, and I guess they could plagiarize components of a corporate description or something, but when it comes down to, you know, a compliance program, most of them pick companies that they work with. 
um, not necessarily public entities, but it has to be an organization you're a part of, right, or have been. So for the for the larger class where they have more of a generalized assignment, yes, I do a lot of plagiarism checks, but for something this specific, I do my own little Google searches if something looks suspicious, but otherwise I, I don't have anything built into it. So you said that there's the final assignment from client's project, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have other assignments that build for this? Right. Project. So each component, um, I'll go back quickly and just show you the uh, the assignment. So here's the uh, here's the program assignment. So this shows you the uh, the structure of it. The four parts are an executive summary, uh, a section on prevention, detection, and response to fraud and related kinds of misconduct. Um, and so they had to give me some of the things they give me early on will help prevent some of the plagiarism issues because why did you select this company? How are you a part of it? Were you a member of a church? Are you, um, you know, did you work for this company? If so, how long? What was your position? It's not a foolproof system, but they have to build up to it. It would actually be easier to write the thing than to go out and try to find that component of a company somewhere. That doesn't mean that they won't try to produce the system. Do I have a similar project? And I was going to use just one case study for the whole entire class. Right. And, and I'd be worried if uh, I opened it up for them to pick a program that they would uh, they wouldn't be able to find the data that they needed. Right. Well, this is literally creation from, from start to finish. So in the executive summary, they have to tell me what are the risks for that particular company. And so they're identifying all those things for me. And, and somebody said, give me some of the grading criteria. Because if you tell me in your executive summary that one of your risks are lack of internal controls, well, your prevention, detection, and response have to go back to where you expect it to be exploited to start with. with internal control. So they don't necessarily need like internal accounting sheets from the no. company or something like that to finish the project. Like no. That. I mean, you could be, let's say you're a self-employed carpenter. Right? It's you and one other person. Well, where are you most likely to get exposed well it's in relationship with your vendors and suppliers right so they they have to identify those early um and normally for, for most written projects i say you write your executive summary last but i need one here because it gives me the context and backdrop to be able to evaluate the other components of the assignment of course they go back and change it extensively by the end of the course or i expect they will i should say this is a brand new course that never been taught so this, this will run for the first time um, starting in October 13. But that's the design is you, you give me the criteria by which I can decide if this is a good program or not. Here's the context, the environment. Here's our uh, risk factors. Uh, part of prevention is a complete risk assessment. So if you tell me what the factors are, did you assess those thoroughly? Did you look at all the, the possible avenues where this thing could get exploited? Did you similar complex projects or from it vary or I, I don't know. Um, I will tell you that I did something very similar for my financial statement analysis course that just finished and they didn't pick similar. I mean they all, for that one it had to be a publicly traded company. I made them pick a Fortune five hundred. But I had one person that did um, Lowe's home improvement stores, another one did um, Kohl's. I mean there there were they were all over the place. And so there wasn't necessarily a good apples apples other than did you meet these criteria. So, so for this class, um, could it potentially be a large class? It, it will build. Um, okay. what, what we're told to expect is that this will be the most popular track in the MBA besides the generalized program. Right. But statistics also indicate that the tracks still remain really s small, okay. right? So. If you have, uh, you guys heard the, uh, the the report yesterday about graduate enrollment growth and all those kinds of things. Um, right now, the accounting track is five percent of the MBA students. Okay. There's 400 students, so we're fighting 1820. Um, we're led to believe that could reach as high as 10 to 12, but probably not more okay. than that. So unless we get 10,000 students in the MBA, we, this is a point to turn into. Uh, I did still build this project so that it can be a group project if we get 40 or 50. Right. That, that was going to be my lead-up yeah. question. Is it, for some reason, you know, 
though, you have a huge influx because there's no cap for the number of students in those courses, correct? But that's getting implemented. Okay. Um, okay. There's a range. We don't know right. exactly what that's going to be. And that will artificially limit these. Okay. I think these are going to top out around 30 to 40. Okay. That's kind of my guess. But at 30 to 40 of these, right. you know, that could still be, so I might very well end up having them work in pairs or up to three or four. Okay. Um, and, and I've built all the classes with that possibility in mind. We just turn this into a group activity. And maybe I change the discussion so they're working on it a little bit in there as they go. But, but the deliverable won't change. Okay. And then one other comment, I noticed um, back in your course, you have the due date of when it's listed. Right. It's probably best to list that it's Central Senior Time. Oh, yes. Um, Thanks. Yeah, there, up there. Yeah. It's, it's November 30th, 1159 Central Standard Time. Right. Because, I mean, from what they say, 23, 28 different states. 28 states and so many different countries. Right. And, yeah. That's... So it's just, it's a helpful little. And, it, and it's, it's odd <laughs> because it's in my 601, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, even here, living so close to the eastern time zone border, it's nice to, yeah. although we talked about that in that Monday group, where it's like, well, technically, if it's Eastern Standard Time, they have another hour to, to turn it in, but. <laughs> well, what I found yeah. though, over the years of doing this is if I put this, unless you're talking about somebody that's halfway around the world, which theoretically you could have, it's still submitted by the time I'm out of bed Monday morning, yeah. and I don't care that much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the end of the course, I do because of deadlines of getting right. grades. But if you turn it in at 1.15 a.m. instead of 11.59, it doesn't matter. I was snoring during the entire <laughs> breadth of that time frame anyway, so. I have a question more about a Blackboard specific question. It's for the, um, you know, for the tenant, you use the calendar, right? Mm -hmm. And you use the, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. Right. Um, and I, I kind of get flipped around when I'm working in the Excel spreadsheet and uh, I'm trying to move away from that and use the Blackboard calendar or use something else. Does the Blackboard calendar have like the USI schedule in terms of uh, dates that are days off or universities closed and all those uh, specific dates? You know what? I'm not, you can most sync your personal calendar you to like it. sync your Outlook calendar to it? I, I don't know about Outlook, but mm -hmm. I'll, um, it's all time. No, no, it's a good yeah. question. Yeah. I mean, because here, for, and that's a very personalized per student. So I'm enrolled in lots of classes, so you'll see lots of them that pop uh -huh. up. And so um, I don't think as a whole, so I can like uncheck these and it'll uncheck from the Blackboard mm -hmm. calendar. But what I really like from this is now, depending on an online class, it may or may not. Um, work this way, but in case we get like a snowstorm and classes are canceled for a couple days or whatever, it's nice to drag and drop either here, because it'll also change on the assignment. So that drag and drop option is available. Mm -hmm. And, it'll, and if you link it properly, it'll update right. your post. And even if you update it within the assignment itself, then it'll update here. So that's a really nice feature with Blackboard. Yeah, with the listing, I'm just, I'm prone to this, I'm getting lost in my data. Mm -hmm. And then constantly, oh, I got this song, I got to do this whole correction thing for this step. But, but, so I, I use this, in fact, if you log in one of my other classes, it look, I use the same background and everything. It's, mm -hmm. um, and so to make sure that I don't do that, when the class is over, I go in and delete all the days. Mm -hmm. I'll put Friday or Sunday, I leave that. Right. Um, but it makes me go back through every instance of your program. program. Right. Just I so know. I don't leave something yeah. that's, you know, February and we're teaching a right. fall class. And I know um, not to overlap ADA compliance or anything like that with an online course, but I know a lot of times we've highlighted to or have a different font or a different color just as a nice catch, like, oh, yeah, I need to change that mm -hmm. for next time. Mm -hmm. So highlighting it is also, I've seen that done, too, because it's just a nice reminder to go back there and look at all the highlighted stuff real quick to see if I need to change it. Anything else? I've never had to grade that essay before. So when you grade those, do you grade also their like writing? Ability? Yeah, in fact, if you, uh, I'll, I'll pull the, one of the rubrics up. I do put the written component in there and I tell them exactly. So I'll take that a step further. I give them a sample. Format it this way. Download this, highlight the text, start typing. Don't, don't go in and try to guess that you got the APA part correct. Um, 
And so there's what I want the title page to look like. Um, here's how you should format the executive summary. Um, there's the headings and subheadings. I, I don't. I don't have time to say, no, 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 that's not how APA works, right? Um, I give them a tutorial to APA elsewhere in the class so they can go in and, and get refreshed. Um, so I don't want this to be foreign when they log in and see it for the first time, but I also don't want them trying to ad lib and say, well, I really don't like the way that, no, no, that's the way it goes. Mm -hmm. right. um, that makes grading, I imagine, a lot easier. It, it does. So, you know, then if I fast forward back over to the rubric, for the final project, I made every component 20%. Uh, There's the writing and format. Shows efforts to make needed improvements from initial draft, clear, well edited, and professional. Um, and I gave you that. Right? I mean, if you put it in the English language, you're, you're there. So, but I do make that a component. And I even make a com component for my discussion post so we don't get kind of a slippery slope. Well, it was okay in the forum, but no, no, no. We're, we're going to write in uh, standard English throughout them. That, that takes care of a lot of those things up front. So. I was thinking too that um, as you teach the class, then you can probably get from students like examples, like the right. best students, and then make them available right. for the next class. Sure. And, and I nearly did that for the entire project. What I decided to do for this one is what you saw for that, um, that sample format that actually was a sample executive summary. I didn't do the whole program, but I wanted to set the tone. It should look like this. It should read this way. You know, without giving them something to copy.